The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. We're live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Minnesota Soccer Podcast. There, there was no Minnesota United Soccer this week, so this is going to be an interesting episode. But here to here to break down other things with me, as always, Nick Hallett, Tom Schreier. How's stuff up north? Can't complain. Ooh, Metropolis is buzzing. Right. <laughs> Uh, we, Tom, did you enjoy the Twins getting the snot beat out of them today? I, I watched that. Uh, ended on a high note with Chris Jimenez both pitching in the game and hitting a home run. Uh, <laughs> outside of that, pretty pretty low uh, low morale with the old Twins. I, I kept the score updates on the phone, and I'm like, what? What is what? What? I, I mean, it, did, it didn't start great when when you know the, these baseball teams are now using a starter concept to pitch to the best hitters. Interesting. Yeah. I like it. I liked the data on that. That was interesting. I think we should hit the Minnesota United small amount of news that Minnesota United did have uh, during this break. Yeah, so a couple of small tidbits of Minnesota United news did happen in the last week of time, the first of which is a departure. Tyron Mears has bid farewell to the United States and is headed home. Uh, Nick, did you catch what club he signed for? Was it West Brom? It was. West Bromwich Albion uh, in England, the second division uh, as of right now. West Brom was in the Premier League last year, but were relegated. Uh, they'd been in the Prem for a few years. Uh, uh-huh. Decent side, decent uh, decent setup to be able to get results at times. And, yeah, just happened to be relegated. You know, typical team just not investing a ton in their – enough in their squad to really hold on to the Prem and got bounced. Um and not a not a foreign place for Tyrone. Obviously, he's obviously English, um, but he's also played in multiple levels in England's pro divisions uh, for years. So, pretty much, I th- and I think the thing I read, I think the thing I read from him was that he just wanted to go home because that, yeah, that was and because that was like interesting. he's late enough in his career that he's got kids. He wants to raise them at home. He wants to be closer to home. Like, there's a lot you can feel about that, and it's good of. I think it was very good of. Minnesota to let him go. We talked last week about how probably about time to be rotating him out of the lineup and getting some of the new guys in for the rest of the season. So this is a perfect way to do that. Get him somewhere where he's going to get some time in, give an opening to some of the new guys, and it works. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, That was what's so interesting, though, when that email came across that they were mutually parting ways. It was like, for why? Like, what's going on? Uh, but, yeah, once you see where he's headed and you hear some of the quotes, it makes perfect sense. It, it, is, a little con- it is a little confusing that West Brom would be that interested in Tyrone Mears, though. I mean, Tyrone, I mean, he actually probably scored one of the goals of the season for United. I don't know if people remember the, the Thunderbolt from about 30 yards out that he scored. I think it was, against, it was on the road. I think it was Seattle. Um, it was it was the one goal in the Seattle game. Oh my gosh, right. stunning, stunning strike! And he obviously one of the best crossers on the team. But man, I mean, at thirty five, and he was picking up injuries left and right. And your West Brom, you just got you just got relegated from the Premier League, and your obviously goal is to try to get back in. Finding a thirty five year old who was playing in the well, MLS that seems peculiar to me. But again, not to say that Tyrone doesn't have quality. I, I would say I'm going to admit I don't know West Brom's roster to any great depth at all but maybe they wanted to bring in somebody with a lot of experience who's played internationally who's been kind of around the block in a lot of different places as like a locker room guy kind of thing later in his career maybe transitioning more towards a coaching whatever kind of role like that a total speculation but like or maybe just somebody get in and stabilize your defense a little bit in the championship every now and then. Just just one of those guys that's more of a glue guy than a you're expecting him to start every weekend out of the massive amounts of games that the championship plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably. That makes sense. I mean, sometimes nothing like a nice amount of experience to add to a squad. 
I mean, it's kind of funny. I, yeah, I wonder if he's going to pull a, t- a Terrence Newman as our first cross sport, sport reference of the day. I love what, it. What an interesting setup that was. Newman yeah. immediately retiring and then immediately joining the coaching staff. Not, was, su- not surprised. He played for Zimmer three times, but it is cool. I know. It's right? cool. It's cool. I, I yeah. quoted it on. Tw- I, I quoted the tweet about it on Twitter and called it the Zim effect. Yeah. Because you don't see that like very often, and I think that's. I think that speaks to. Well, to and, and every now and then you see the guys like. I know I can't put put a name on the top of my uh, off the top of my head, but there have been guys who like while they're playing in England have been like doing their coaching badges and stuff, so they can just make that transition straight into the locker room. And like you see, Steven Gerrard at Rangers did not take very much time between retiring from playing and getting right into the locker room. True. Same with Frank Lampard; they did it at the exact same times. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. So, like, there's, it's not the most uncommon thing in the world, and especially, like, you'd think for a guy like Mears, who's kind of not the biggest name, not the biggest, like, priority player, but it's been around, has done some locker room stuff, has been a good dude. Might be a thing that makes sense for his transition into his rest of his life after his playing career is done. Yeah, and literally, I mean, Ryan, I don't know if you recall, but Ryan Giggs for Manchester United literally was a player manager because... They yep. fired David Moyes. There's only a few games left in the season, so he was, he was a player. He was managing, and and, and he even played himself uh, in one of the games. It was crazy. Um, Which so. all all the credit in the world to Ryan Giggs, who was a stud. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. So, um, but I so I guess what's your thoughts on on Mears leaving the squad? Then how do you feel about his? De- his his presence no longer being felt. He already wasn't playing most of the time the last two three months, including during the best parts of the season. So like, I think it made sense. I'm glad that there was a mutual agreement to part ways rather than like a just wait until the end of the MLS season and leave him without a club until January. Like, it it seems like. A move that made sense. And even though you like, we talked last week about looking at Minnesota's squad going into the DC game and how short it looks with the international games and the suspensions and all this stuff. Still, like, it seems like they did right by Tyrone. And it seems like he definitely wasn't in the club's long term picture past this year. So for them to cut ties with him six weeks early, I don't see any problem with it. I enjoyed his time here. I thought that. His impact early in the season was much more noticeable than it was after um, Darwin and Alexi actually came in because Alexi took a lot of the dead ball uh, responsibility away from him, partially through taking his spot in the squad. But, like, you just you didn't see as much of in the very early part of the season when every dead ball was Tyrone Mears making stuff, trying to make stuff happen, and sometimes get, getting some pretty good hits in. Oh, so, yeah, he served in great dead balls a lot of times. Yeah, so all the credit in the world. He was good. I think he was good for the team overall this year, but this is the time to move on Time to move on from him. He's not in your long-term picture. Doing it to get him in a good place at a good time, totally good. Best wishes to him. I, yeah, I think it's especially fair considering it's kind of become clear that United is not going to make the postseason and has no threat to do so so yeah exactly might as well let him depart anyway um so i think the timing of it does work work well but i think it's clear outside back is still a mystery situation for united because right now in my opinion they're really low on that they don't you know they need some outside back help but it's it's confound it's 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 a complicated situation because it's not clear exactly what formation he well i was gonna say the formation's the biggest tell for that for me like we don't know what the real plan is moving forward. Yeah, I would be I'm, I'm, my. I'm going to go with my prediction is that he's going to go going into next year um, and with a few more acquisitions. He's going to revert to his favored uh, formation of some form of a four five one or four uh, four two three one four so, two three one. Yeah. So I think he's gonna. I think that's what we'll. I, that I'm when I picture first game at Allianz Field next year that's what I picture seeing so in that case I mean T.I. Sun could be the starting right back but and Manley might be on the squad and you might feel comfortable with Manley at that point but I'm not so sure 
Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if another right back is added at some point. Unless he converts, it'd be kind of funny. He could also convert Miguel. Miguel uh, full time. That was the that was the thing I was wondering about. Possibly, I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah, but I, don't know. I mean, he's played parts of the position this year, but playing it in a in a four at the back system has some different necessities to it. I yep. think. Yep. So, so we'll see. the other small bit of squad news, if unless you have any more thoughts on Tyrone. No, no, that's good. Uh, Mason Toy scored a goal. Ayo. Uh, Mason is playing for, uh, boy, Charlotte, I want to say, in the USL. That's funny. I have a friend who used to play for Charlotte, actually. But go ahead. Oh, no, Colorado Springs. There we go. Oh, okay. Colorado Springs switchback. So he scored a goal 11 minutes into Colorado's game. Uh, yesterday to get kind of off his personal duck for the season. Um, so that's good to see. Sounded like it was pretty good, confident finish. Beat beat his defender, Meg the keeper. You know, good stuff. Kind of thing you want to see from Mason down down the lower tiers. Get some confidence going. Because really, like if he if he can get a few goals in him in the USL, you might you think we might see him towards the end of this season especially as the end of the playoff race is confirmed yeah yeah it's true and it's what's that's kind of fun about the way that they're doing this is that they're doing it almost they're doing it less like european loans and they're doing it more like promotion to motions like in major league baseball uh where they yeah, kinda, it feels very american sports <laughs> yeah they're kind of like putting these guys down and then pulling them up and then putting them down and then pulling them up and i mean potentially ideal development uh, or, or at least more game time for Mason uh, and others. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it does positive things for Mason. Yep. So that's that was a good thing to see. Just because I mean he's had his moments this season where it's looked like it just needs to get in the back of the net for him, and so it's good to good to see that happen. See if it lights a spark in him in future games in Colorado or back up with Minnesota, depending on how stuff shakes out moving forward. Is is um, that a, is that an equivalent? Is that like going to AAA or is what's the gap between MLS it and is. another? Okay. No, it's precisely that. I, I, I think it's basically AAA. Yeah. Okay. Like it's plenty of it's players that have played in MLS and will play in MLS, but not right now. Yeah. No, it's the only way it's exactly like a tr- the difference between AAA versus the majors. The literal only like the only difference you could pull is that it's not like Minnesota has multiple affiliates. Yeah, and there's not multiple and affiliates and it's not like there's not clear like yes, this is our affiliate that we send players to. It's not like Well, it, it does much more resemble the NBA NHL model of recent years with the You've got your minor league affiliate that's your team, that's your players. Some MLS teams have moved towards that. The Minnesotan front office has talked about moving towards that model if they can get a USL team established, whether elsewhere in the state or somewhere else close in the Midwest. It, it's kind of the same point the Timberwolves were at prior to the Iowa Wolves being acquired last year, where like they're sending these guys out to Las Vegas where – um, Carter Manley is w- Colorado, where Toy is Charlotte, where um, Awundi is. That's who I was trying to think of. Um, and then Wyatt, and, too. Yeah. And Omsberg, where he's a Pittsburgh? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He, he's somewhere also in the USL. But, like, you're sending these guys out across the team, maybe not necessarily playing in your system, maybe not getting the minutes you want them to get. I know we've seen that with Carter in particular, who hasn't been getting starting minutes for Las Vegas, which is frustrating. Um, yeah, I know. I've seen you tweet about that. That's well, it's like the entire point, as Adrian Heath stressed when talking about this is these guys need to play 90 minutes and get used to playing 90 minutes and so if manley's gonna go ride the bench for 90 minutes in vegas like why is he doing that there and not here like he can do that just as well here in the system that he's gonna be playing and with the people that he's gonna be playing with like you don't want to send a guy on loan to go sit on the bench <laughs> precisely no it's so true. that's like the the counterpoint to having your own like your own direct connected usl team is Probably going to have to worry a little bit less about that when your front office and their front office are mostly the same front office. 
Yes, that would be ideal. So I, I know, boy, it's been months since that came up, but I, I feel like I remember a conversation with um, Chris Wright, the CEO of the organization, where they've looked into USL spots and organizations and um, potential moving maybe not into next season, but maybe 2020. I know it's I know it's a goal the club has openly stated they have is to create that kind of relationship. So that's a thing to keep an eye on moving forward, because like in a year like this where you've got four draft picks that aren't really any of them going to get time in the big team in a, in a perfect world, they've got to have somewhere to play. And if you've got control over that, it's a great way to get them some growth, get them playing time, all of the above. Absolutely. So other I think that's about it for Minnesota this week. It's been a quiet week. Not much has happened. Nope. Um, Across the MLS uh, and across the U.S. men's national team, we saw the retirement of one of the greatest players in U.S. men's national team history, if not the greatest. I think that's a worthwhile discussion to have as Clint Dempsey announced his retirement from professional soccer from the Seattle Sounders earlier this week nick what were your thoughts when you saw dempsey was retiring effective immediately i was obviously you know that like had like that one teardrop you know come out of my eye just like (laughs) oh it's over what a great run from deuce um i'll never forget what he's done for this for the national team and for u.s soccer because man he just brought one just in individual games brought like a swagger that no one else has ever been able to even landon donovan the other greatest player to ever play for the national team. Like, Donovan was so good. Uh, was able to play in Europe, too, like Dempsey was. But Donovan had minimal to no swagger. Dempsey was, like, that dude that, like, he just didn't mess with. He was tough, but he was cool, and he was good. And, man, he just... He was a guy that a lot of Americans could latch on to. And, and another thing that he did for Americans, you know, young Americans like myself playing, young Americans still playing, he he had a run in Europe where, again, we had this guy in Landon Donovan who's like, this is our guy, he's our best player, he's our captain, he's our leading scorer, all these things. And then when Donovan ever tried to play in Europe, it didn't go very well. And that was, you know... That was really an indictment on U.S. soccer. And what Dempsey was so amazing is is right around that time and right after Donovan's kind of shortcomings in Europe, Dempsey rode this awesome wave with Fulham where he was playing in a solid Premier League team who was doing well in England and then doing well in the Europa League. And he was a key piece of all of that, so much so that Tottenham came in, uh, your beloved Tottenham, David, came in and bought him. And it was just, it was such an amazing wave for American soccer. And he continued it when he came back to Seattle um, in the MLS and, you know, won them a championship and, you know, scored bags and bags of goals. So amazing, amazing stuff from Deuce. And it's, yeah, again, the one tier of sadness that he's gone. I have regrets about not purchasing a Dempsey Spurs jersey. I have significant regrets about that. Yeah, man. Um, you never know when you're going to get another American playing for Tottenham. You never know. That could never happen for, like, yeah, ever. Like, well, I guess, actually, that's false. Cameron Carter Vickers exists. but CCV exists. Um, but he might not ever be a dude like Dempsey was. Yeah. And Utah, the, the the run with Fulham was the thing I wanted to bring up because it still feels like that's not hugely in the American eye that that happened. Like, everybody knows he played for the national team. Everybody knows the Dempsey phase. Everybody knows all, all, all the swagger and all the stuff that he's brought. But, like, the impact that he had on that Fulham season and their run in the Europa League, I think they all got all the way to the semifinals of the finals of that tournament. If you are listening to this podcast and have not seen Clint Dempsey's goal against Juventus from the, that Europa League run, go look it up on YouTube right now. I, it was the first thing I did when it, I heard he retired because it's an, ama- it's an amazing goal at a hugely impactful time in a tense European tie against a team that has now won six or seven straight Italian titles – while Fulham have dropped down to the championship and only recently have come back up. Like, 
it's a little bit surreal to see that both in terms of the teams involved and the fact that that's Clint Dempsey out there in a Europa League playoff moment scoring a ridiculous goal. And that like that that blew my mind at the time. It still blows my mind today. He's been a wonderful player to watch for years. I and the the thing in terms of like his American understanding is there's been lots written about his upbringing and the where he came from in Texas and coming from a family that wasn't very well off that didn't have the capabilities for him to necessarily go out play the highest tier of club soccer, play the highest tier of traveling soccer, which we see so many of today's youth grow up with that system from very young ages for for him to come not from that point of privilege and to have just worked and worked and worked and worked to get where he's been to be possibly the greatest soccer player in the history of his country is it's an incredible and very like stereotypically american story so he's an easy guy to like oh my gosh so much so and again i you really do have to put him on, in some ways, on that level of like a Jackie Robinson uh, because he pioneered and made it where uh, no other American had made it or where other Americans had been and failed, and he succeeded and exceeded in fantastic style. So I, I just think I think he he broke down some barriers in not almost like fig- obviously most barriers in this type of se- sense are figurative, yeah. but like mental barriers for so many American kids who maybe didn't believe that they could be pro soccer players uh, on, on the highest level. And so now that we're seeing this flood of of young Americans playing in Europe at top clubs, Christian Pulisic, Timothy Weah, uh, Weston McKinney's, those type of guys. You can't help but think that Clint Dempsey played a role in that, and it's it's amazing. Yep, I will I will make one asterisk. Dempsey broke down that wall for American outfield players. Uh, American goalkeeping is a fine art that sure was purchased but in Europe wildly. Before yeah. Dempsey, shout out to Tim Howard the Great. <laughs> Fan, yeah, fair fair enough, but like wildly different world. Oh yeah, no, totally. I'm. T- because American goalies have – that's been a thing for a while. But for it to be an outfield player, an attacking player, that, it was a huge difference. So I'm, I'm 100% with you. Just got to give a shout-out to Tim Howard. Yes, yeah. Because no. I remember – I that that's like one of my like child soccer playing memories is seeing – seeing an American goalkeeper in a Manchester United jersey on the cover of Sports Illustrated as, like, a 12-year-old soccer player, that blew my mind. <laughs> it, it's, it is true. It's it's actually still even mind-blowing to think about now. Like, how did he do that? Like, it, it is. He, he, he is among that group. Him, Landon, uh, and Dempsey, those three did countless, countless amazing things for U.S. soccer that will be felt for generations. Who's number one? Between the three of them or Donovan yep. versus Dempsey? Either one. Who's number one? <sighs> I – it's hard not to go Donovan considering like his – he's the MLS's leading all-time goal scorer. He, him and Dempsey are now tied for like all-time U.S. goals. He's – I think Donovan's still the leader in all-time caps. So Donovan kind of has all the numbers. Um, but – to me, I just – what Dempsey was able to do in Europe and, like, the swagger with which he did everything, which is more my jive, I, I vote Dempsey. <laughs> but, I mean, geez, talk about splitting hairs. I mean, those two guys. Well, it, it's, one, it's one of those things that, like, it immediately became a conversation because that's – when you have both of those two dudes retired or, in Donovan's case, functionally retired um, – they're so because of that tie in the men's national team goal race. There's always going to be that conversation, and now it's just going to keep being a conversation until Kristen Pulisic is there in both of them. Yeah. Like it, it will. It'll it'll be like how willing. yeah, it'll be how like Michael Jordan's always mentioned around LeBron James, Jack Nicholas always mentioned around Tiger Woods. That's the future for Christian Pulisic in a lot of ways. Is how often he's going to, as he does things, as he achieves things for the U.S. national team, if he does. Uh, it'll be constantly. You'll start being. He'll be, what is Donovan and Dempsey will be brought up? What is Peel Six decision? Who does he spurn on his way to greatness? Oh, jeez, you're gonna make him. You're gonna go LeBron <laughs> comparison. 
Um, I it's don't awkward because he doesn't play for an American team. Like, yeah, it, I don't think nothing of that nature will really come about. He well, he's not getting drafted by his hometown team. Like, he's been playing in Europe since he was in high school what, age. What, what if like, he's like, I'm going to Canada? <laughs> that would not go over well. No. Can't also, you can't. Your tune. Also, you can't. <laughs> he's locked in. That's good. Yeah, it is good. Yeah. Across the... Across the uh, Pacific Ocean from the MLS, moving towards European considerations by way of Asia, uh, the Asian Games soccer tournament received a much higher (laughs) uh, audience in the world's eye, particularly thanks to fans of Tottenham Hotspur FC. Maybe exclusively thanks to... Yeah, because of the fact that should the South Korean national team have won the Asian Games, which they did, uh, Human Son would have been exempted and is exempted from doing his mandatory military service as required by the South Korean government. And they did it. They won. It was they had some nail biters along the way, but they they made it happen. And I I I will say I saw the. Um, the, the video of like the Korean team after the final whistle of the of the last game, and that was a, a meaningful, huge thing for, for sure. those players. For sure, I mean, the, you got a gold medal for your country. That's dope in and of itself. I guess they who I mean the Asia games though, it's like Minnesota State Fair games are about the same. Oh, you hit the state fair. Same That's how it is. Yeah, stay hit hit the state. No, fair. that was a hate on the Asia games. Oh God, I also do not like the state fair. <laughs> God, oh, Naylor. But how? What? What a what a weird predicament in a, like what a weird situation, and I mean, how dumb would South Korea be to? I I get the, the it's cute and it's. It's traditional to like have this have this ruling affect every citizen the same. Like no matter what, able-bodied man before the age twenty-eight, you have to enroll in military service, no matter who you are. But to have your great, potentially your greatest ever athlete, who has done countless amazing things for your country globally, to make that guy to not make an exception for that guy. And ma- and have him go into military service regardless if they'd have lost this game. Come on, this that would have been this, outrageous. This, however, will be probably a thirty for thirty, and likely a movie. Right? I mean, it could give soccer some good publicity. It doesn't have enough drama, I don't think. To ma- I mean, it's best. I guess he loses the soccer game, but he won it, so he doesn't have to go into military service. Alternate history. So, well, <laughs> I think Tom's the, the backstory <laughs> is I don't even necessarily blame south korea i blame his previous club in germany who didn't let him go to the last asian games i i hear which, you when i read which all, south korea also won when i read all the details in this i did look at Bayer leverkusen and go like what the heck guys come on yeah, but like, i think that's on. i i yeah but i you're i think you're miss you're you're i think you're sharing the weight in a weird so, way i think it's I, it's it's south korea is not allowing their best ever athlete an exemption is stupid. Like uh, le- so okay, so this is the the this is how I want you to to look at this situation David is let's pretend South Korea lost in this final. How do you feel? Do it. How do you feel about South Korea not exempting him and forcing him into military service? I'm going to try very hard not to make political statements right now, but I feel <laughs> like it's justified within the laws of the country and they have their reasons for it. So you you wouldn't be that upset? I I would be sad because you have because you have because you have a u- unique you have also the very unique situation of being a Tottenham fan in this situation. Uh, and I'm not like, I would, and I'm I not even sad. I would be sad for Son because like him personally, it like I have no doubt that he would have been committed to serving his country and done all of the right things in that regard. But like for his. Not least for his financial future, but for a lot of elements of it. Like, if you have that, like, gap in probably, like, two of the peak years of his career, 
he probably gets sold by Spurs, probably would be out of contract for a couple of years, and then who knows like what ha- what happens when we see him in a couple of years. It's one of those things that like it's a situation that we don't we don't know what that looks like. Yeah, we know it. Lo- we know it derails it, him to be involved in this. We know it would wildly derail his career. Yeah, I, yeah. The likelihood, I, like I would be, I would be sad for him, but I don't have to be, and it's great. <laughs> That's a I, cop out. Here, here. Well, here is here is my. Um, my esports tie-in because I get to make an esports tie-in. <laughs> no one, this. no this one is... approved of esports tie-in. Oh no, no, I did. No, I'm be, really because it. because it involves South Korea. That's why it ma- that's why it matters because South Korea has probably the single most highly developed esports culture in the world. Bigger than Japan doing... and China's. What? Bigger than Japan and China's? Yes, a hundred percent. Oh wow, that's cool. I didn't know that. Um. And it's specifically in esports, not necessarily in gaming as a whole, but in like competitive okay. things. Like they've okay. had they they had the StarCraft scene. They've had the like the best teams in all of the like traditionally relevant esports have been Korean teams. The best League of Legends teams in the world right now are Korean teams, and every Korean player involved in those the best ones from top to bottom still have to do their military service. And this is in a culture where esports are on mainstream television. These players are celebrities in their country. Wow. Still got to do it. It's part of the game. And they League of Legends was uh, actually a part of the Asian games um, on a trial basis. It was a demonstration oh, of it rather cool. than a fully competitive event. And the Korean team lost in the final of it, which oh, was, wow. a number one, a huge upset. And number two... Not a great look for your your team moving forward because it's one of those things that if it became a full part of the Asian Games in the future, which they 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 trialed six esports at the Asian Games as a possible full addition to the events. That's so cool. Then you have the national team for that. If you win that gold medal, you could get an exemption from your military service. <laughs> so it was. I think they can interesting win. to look at that. I watched much more of the Asian Games League of Legends tournament than I did of the Asian Games soccer tournament because. I find that element of it to be very interesting. It's the first, like, multi-sport games of that level to include esports, and it's one of those things that that sets the table for possible things moving forward in the future for national teams to include that kind of thing. That's really so cool. So it's what? it's interesting from a to like looking at it from a Korean perspective across multiple different sports. It's They've got to do it. It's part of life for those guys. And so the fact that Son One is cool, and the fact that he's exempt is cool and great for him. But like, I wouldn't be critical of him if he didn't, because it's a part of life there. Like, no, and, and I get it. I get it because like, what better example of your policy of making everyone go into the military by not, by also having like your 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 famous yeah. guys, your your biggest sports guys, they have to do it too. Like no matter what. And I get that. That does send a strong message, but I, I just think that it's you know you can there's ways to set it up that there's a few exemptions, and I just feel like and again maybe you know Korean culture. I'm yeah, sure they have is, one. They won the gold medal. That's the exemption. I, to make it to make <laughs> it like 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 that type of like logistical thing is weird to me. Son has done amazing things for Korea globally for their outlook. For youth Koreans who want to try to, you know, do anything and become famous and successful in across the world, you know, someone like Hae Ming Sun provides amazing, you know, amazing belief for that. And so, whether it be in soccer or science or business, to have see a pioneer like Son do that, and then to have him thwarted because of it, because of your military policy, I just think that would have hurt. People, I don't know. I, I can't pretend to also understand Korean um, culture and and how they look at everything. So it just that's just my take on it. What? Well, other- yeah, and that was. Go ahead. That was kind of the point I wanted to close on. Is I know that we are two guys from the Midwest, United States, that might not have the greatest grasp on this. And if there are things that we've missed in this conversation that 
we should know about and might talk about on the next episode or need to need to clarify, please let us know, because it, it's a topic that I find interesting, but I want to make sure that I we get everything right. So and of course, yeah, and of course, back in on that if we need to. Yeah, true. And of course, there's the fact that uh, they obviously have a neighbor in North Korea that is, you know, set to set to violence, you know, relatively easy as has been documented in the past and as a threat constantly. So the the need for military service is very much a real thing when it comes to Korean life uh, south or north. So that's that's fair. Out of curiosity, who, what were the other esports that were trialed in the Asia Games? Because I've heard of League of Legends. Have I heard of the any of the other five? It was League of Legends and StarCraft Two, and um, those were the two I paid the most attention to. I'd have to go digging to see what the other ones were. Um, Was it any games that are like really mainstream, like a Halo or a Call of Duty, or <laughs> those are mainstream in the United States, my friend, <laughs> uh, and and only there? Pretty close. Yep. Okay. Let's see. But still, there's gotta uh, be arena main- here. Arena of Valor, which, uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> never Clash heard Royale. Of it. Nope. Never heard of it. Clash Royale. Uh, Hearthstone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. League Nerd of alerts. <laughs> um, Pro Evolution Soccer. What? Yep. They, why don't they do FIFA? I think PES is still bigger than FIFA in Asia, but that is a guess. I Because I know FIFA is much bigger in the United States and in Europe. That might be more of a, a commerce, but overall user numbers are far bigger. Yep. And um, StarCraft 2 was the last one. Yeah. So, That's six cool. games. Yeah, well... A soccer pro soccer game, or like a, a, a soccer video game. That's freaking. That's really cool. Yep, and that's I. I might I still be able to win the much. Asia games, you guys. I'm sick. At, I'm sick on the sticks when it comes to soccer. Games. Are you? Oh I'm yeah. Aggressively mediocre. Oh man, I'm aggressively good. Do I've you, been ranked uh, in the world. Do you spend money on Ultimate times. Team? Uh, You've been ranked in the world. Yeah, in 2008, I was in the top 2,000. Oh my god! And in 2013, I was in the top, uh, like fifty thousand. Huh. Yeah, in 2008, I was in the top one percent in the country in AP test scores. <laughs> oh wow! Oh god! That was that was an overt brag. That's yes. just what that was. Yeah. yeah. Overt. You're, pat on you're the back. bragging about video games. I'm going to brag on academia. That's fine. We can I, we can take I, our no, I, we can each take our strong suits. <laughs> I know somebody who dropped a thousand dollars in Ultimate Team last year. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people of, do. It's a lot of money. Yeah. They that's, they created a smart way to steal money from people. I really hate EA, but that's a long conversation not for this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So since we've Beating the topic of human song to death. Let's talk about his team on Monday, not today, on Monday of last week. Let's talk about their week. Yeah, that's that'll be yeah. interesting. How? Uh, what a game against Manchester United. Um, it, my question to you would be: Do you feel like they completely one hundred percent deserved all three points in that game? On the basis of the first half, I wasn't sure they were getting any. Exactly. Like and and Pochettino said that, and he said that after today's game, which they lost to Watford two one pretty pathetically. That like the warning signs were there. Yeah, they played excellently in the second half, converted their chances, did their business against Manchester United, which was awesome. It was a great game to watch. It was very exciting all the way through, albeit not necessarily the most positive in the first half. Because boy, Manchester United just scored some goals. Um, yep, but. But, like, the warning signs were there that a dud performance was coming. And to go to Watford, not the easiest ground to play at, and lose 2-1 with your only goal being an own goal is not a great look. So, like, Spurs played 45 minutes of good soccer this week and got three points out of six. So, like, I can work with that. But, yeah, the... Back to your original question, I I think they deserved all three points on the overall balance of play and certainly on conversion of chances, but if you asked me that over the first half, I wasn't feeling great. 
Yeah, and I would say I would say it's even less than like they played awesome in the second half, and more that they just countered effectively and, yep, and, and they just they took care of business. Yeah, yeah, no, ruthlessly countered and finished the chance that they had, um, in, including Kane's header, which wasn't a counter, but you know, bit still kind of against the run of plays, assuredly. And so, yeah, they just were they were good in front of goal. Lucas Moore, obviously, especially, which was utterly surprising, uh, and then. Yeah, I don't know. So to me, yeah, they definitely won, but did they really deserve that win? I, I don't, I don't know. And I think today's result, to your point, kind of shows that. That like, I mean, fair enough. Games are going to go like that, and you do deserve to win if you counter and you win and you defend well enough, um, for sure. But not necessarily. Tottenham wasn't necessarily pl- balling out both games, and and no, I totally show that. agree. Yeah. And shout out to Watford, the winner of that game, who are at the top of the Premier League table right now behind Liverpool and Chelsea on goal difference with 12 points from four games. They have taken care of business. That's so crazy. That's so funny. And and going into a season that they changed, they lost their manager and sold arguably one, their best player in Richarlison, and now they're 4-0. That's crazy. Good for well, them. Well, and it, I will say perhaps um, – Spurs were feeling nice to Elton John and didn't want to beat Elton John's team in Elton John's team's house today. Because the first news alert I got about this game was that Elton John was at the Watford game. Elton John's a huge Watford fan. He's a huge Watford fan. So it's like, maybe we didn't want to give a deal Elton John an L today. Do you, and that's, do you guys <laughs> like, are all Spurs fans tiny dancers or what? I don't understand. <laughs> I don't. I don't understand I why. I'm. I'm grasping at straws. I got nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't watch the. I didn't watch this game yet. I haven't seen the highlights. So, so you felt like overall Tottenham just played really poorly. I, I admittedly also have not watched the game, but boy, from everything I've read about it, they weren't good. Yeah, my. I heard it was just I, one of the things I heard is that it was a, just an exceptional comeback from Watford. So maybe Tottenham played well early on, but. Watford's a, a grinder type group, and so yep. that doesn't shock me that they were able to do that. All right. Well, to turn it around, <laughs> Nick, how did you feel about Manchester United's week? Uh, well, they cost me eight dollars and fifty cents uh. for a six pack of Mick Golden Light. I'm gonna get you sh- crap beer, man. Like we didn't. I, I know you are. We, we, had, we I, I realized after we made the bet that I didn't specify on that. And I'm like, I'm getting a six pack of like uh, steel toe. I'm, I'm getting you. I'm gonna make it a little. I'm gonna make it a little I, more I have snazzy. Sta- than I want that. standards on this podcast. What do you got here? <laughs> I'm gonna get David a uh, six pack of Bud Light Orange. No, stop. <laughs> God, no. What for his car for fuel? <laughs> <laughs> the email Bud Light emailed me. They're coming out with the newest fruit flavor. It's gonna be tutti frutti. So I'm gonna get them Bud Light tutti frutti. Gummy bear. You Bud Light's email distribution list. <laughs> uh, have you had Bud Light lime? It's delicious. <laughs> uh, yeah. As a former St. Louis, and I don't like most things that Budweiser produces. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I want some class. I want at least decent beer here. Summit. Not some swell. Some summit. Some surly. Surly. Oh, lazy slipper. Sipper. My beard itches. <laughs> Good grief. I've never had a beard before. Yeah, God. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> y- your team done lost. Um, okay, so and, you know what's funny? I, okay, well, to get more specific, how did you feel when you saw Jose Mourinho's post-match press conference in which he essentially said, count these rings. That was hilarious. My, You know what my favorite part about that was? Is that he, he to diss that reporter, he drops the stat that if you combine all the other Premier League managers, that he has three titles and they only have two. Therefore, he is better than all of them, uh, according to that statistic. Yeah, put together. Uh, which is... So, like, silly because, like, the reporter could have been like, oh, like, I'm holding up, you know, nine hands. I'm holding up nine fingers, and that's the amount of titles Pep Guardiola's won in different <laughs> leagues, you know, or whatever. So, but what? Well, no, what, it, was, it was the fact that he led into it 
with the fact that they lost three to nothing. And he's like, yeah, we lost three to nothing. You know what else is three? The number of rings I got on these fingers. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was a bold move in us uh, and swaggy as heck. I, I like it. How long it. has he been waiting for but, Arsene Wenger so he can pull that line? Well, that's what's so funny to me is like he – That's the, and I didn't even get to it. That's the best part is that he clearly knew that stat and was holstering it and waiting – to whip it out and fire it at someone at some point. So that's what's hilarious about that situation is you know he was sitting on that and waiting. Who knew when he would use it, but uh, it's awesome. But I, I'm actually, as, as people, you know, as the listeners of the show would know, I, I'm, a, I'm very upset with Mourinho. I'm not happy with Mourinho. I don't think he's a good fit. And I, so coming out of this game, hilarious post conf, uh, post-game press conference, uh, this, you know, regardless, I actually wanted them going into this game against Burnley. I wanted them to lose, and I know that's the mortal sin of a lot of you know f- you know fandom. But that's really what I wanted. I wanted them to lose and lose badly, preferably to Burnley, because I'd love to see him sacked. Not because I think he's a bad manager. Not because I don't think he can uh, like a terrible manager. Not that I don't think that he can lead them to. You know, back to the Champions League and decent results in the Champions League and um, a decent showing in the Prem. He can do all those things, but I think it, ultimately his upside is limited, and a club like Manchester United should never have to settle for that. And he's also a club like Manchester United should never have to settle for a guy who wants to play pragmatic, weak, defensive, slow football. And that's that's exactly what he does. And I, I want him out. And I don't think that's an unfair thing to say. Hey, I, I was just looking through Manchester United headlines this week, and I noticed that Mourinho quoted German philosophy in his press conference on Friday. Like, this dude, <laughs> he's an artist. He will, yeah. He will, the, That is the one positive from me, my perspective. As long as he stays on, it sounds like he's turned the dial to entertaining Mourinho. So it'll be interesting. Just totally insane, Mourinho, but yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting going forward, which is, you know, kind of a win-win for everyone. I was going to say, the headlines are phenomenal. Like, I I just scroll back. As far as Friday, Mourinho says he is one of the great managers and quotes Hegel to prove it. (laughs) Like, who does that? (laughs) That's awesome. So you you mentioned uh, getting back to the Champions League. The other thing that happened that I almost forgot about that we should talk about is the UEFA Champions League draw, which happened this week. Yeah, speaking of a rough some, week for Tottenham. spicy stuff in it. <laughs> yeah, talk about a rough week for Tottenham. Yikes. That's, what did you that's, think? What did you think of that draw? Remember, that's what we said and everybody said, and I thought last year, and they won their group. Okay, that's a good so, retort. That's like, a good retort. I, I think it's a challenge. I think the club needs a challenge, and I think that they've got to show up. They should get second in this group at minimum. Who Who is it again? Inter? Group B is Barcelona, Tottenham, Inter, and PSV from yeah. the other ones. Yeah, they'd be, yeah. They Th- should absolutely get second in that group and challenge Barcelona for first. Well, they're, yeah, they're fav- they'll be favored to finish second. Uh, and go and go through, but it's just my point it, in the past. Regardless of how their team's doing, regardless of anything else, the fact of the matter is they are in the hardest group, and so that's yeah, not not ideal. Well, it, but and then you look around and you see like the well, you look at a group D with uh, Lokomotiv Moscow, Porto, Schalke, and Galatasaray. You know, I wouldn't have minded that. <laughs> right. I wouldn't have minded sitting in that group. Right. Where do, how do you feel about uh, Juventus, Manchester United, Valencia, and Young Boys Bern from Switzerland? I think it's a great draw. I mean, you, you get Young Boys in Valencia who don't scare you at all. Um, and then you get a nice, fun, marquee matchup against Juventus. And the cool thing from a United perspective is that obviously uh, involves Cristiano Ronaldo. Back. Yeah, bringing Ronaldo back to Old Trafford, which is he's actually done before uh, with Madrid. Um, and that was a really fun for everyone, and it's kind of the same here. Um, and you're always gonna likely, other than like the one group you mentioned, there's usually two top dogs in each group, so you got to have someone. So might as well be Juventus. And, well, and so yeah, 
the thing I will say is Valencia were sneaky good for a lot of last season. I think they could be more interesting than we think. But they, they could. They could. Uh, and and historically, La Liga teams, whether they be the champion of La Liga or the second or third or fourth best team, they always, always do well in cup competitions. So, no, don't. I, I do kind of breeze past them. But it's just because I, I think to me at this point it's so standard procedure that they are what they are. They're going to be a tough out. Um, and But again, uh, as a United fan, the way I look at it too, though, is like, yes, Valencia, Atletico Madrid, Sevilla, whomever you might be facing in that situation, they are what they are. But if you are Manchester United and you hope to even challenge and even consider thinking about holding the Champions League trophy, you need to be able to handle that. And if you can't, then what's it matter? If you can't handle Valencia home and away, then what are we talking about? Yep, 100% on board. And that, like, exactly the same for Tottenham in regards to Inter, right? Like, they should be able to clean this up if they've got any kind of aspirations of moving high in the competition. Looking around at the other English teams in the draw, Manchester City's group, uh, Shakhtar, Donetsk, Lyon, and Hoffenheim. How many goals are Manchester City going to score in their group play? A lot. As well, a little bit less now that De Bruyne is going to be missing, but they're they're going to do a lot. They're going to they're easily going to coast to the, fu- they, to the like, top. Like they the should coast to minimum seven, minimum like sixteen points from that group. <laughs> Seriously, no, that's going to be easy. And Liverpool's group is fun. Yeah, I, I am looking forward to watching the games in Liverpool's group. Paris Saint Germain, Napoli, Liverpool, and Red Star Belgrade. Second toughest group uh, by far because uh, you have. Three relative powerhouses. Um, one one really good team is going to go home, and all three of those teams. I, I mean, it's going to be favored. Like we talked about the Tottenham group, it's going to be PSG favored to be number one. Liverpool is going to be favored to be number two, and Napoli will be third. But Napoli could. You never know. Napoli easily could, for whatever reason, win that group uh, and push PS, PSG or Liverpool out. Um, so who knows? It should be fun. Yeah. The other interesting group in regards to having three potentially good teams is Group A with Atletico Madrid, Dortmund, and Monaco with Club Bruges from Belgium as the fourth team. Not a bad group at all. Uh, yeah, Dortmund, like th- those are fun. Yeah. I still would rank that as a lower group than the one we just talked about. Um, oh, for sure. Monaco hasn't reinvested their funds uh, very much in, in all the player losses that they've seen, and the same goes for Dortmund. They both could be really potent clubs, but they're they're both really like question marks on this stage on the Champions League level because they have not aggressively reinvested all the sales, and they've both done a ton of sales. So, yep. And the two groups we haven't talked about feel like the easiest to predict on paper: Group E with Bayern Munich, Benfica, Ajax, and AEK from Greece. Bayern Benfica probably favored. Ajax could be fun. I think Ajax could get through. They look good. I watched a little bit of their playoff. They looked really good. But, yeah, I mean, Bayern goes through. And in, in Group G with Real Madrid, Roma, Cheska, Moscow, and Victoria pulls in from the Czech Republic. I mean, Ro- you that Ro- seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, that one seems pretty. I don't. I, it's hard, really hard to imagine Roma not getting out. And, obviously, Madrid's going to go through top. I was going to say, I even I haven't paid much attention to La Liga, but I can't imagine that Madrid team is that bad. <laughs> No, they've been doing really well. Benzema, yep. Benzema's like on fire right now. Bale's now the featured guy, and that suits that team just as well. So, perfectly. They, they, yep. Yeah, so they're doing well. I am excited for those games to come through. There's there's a lot of like there's a lot of really good groups that are going to have some really fun games across the board both in terms of like my own interests because tottenham inter brings back some really really nice memories from 2010 2011 <laughs> yeah it does that was fun uh, i remember that vividly i was watching those games gareth bale's yeah. coming out party Gar- gareth bale roasting mike on on a platter and delivering uh, him to adoring fans that was so sick <laughs> So those bring back fond memories, but there's, there's stuff all across the board. This is going to be great fun to watch. Champions League always is. So with that, I'm about out of stuff to talk about. Do you have anything else that we need to touch on this week? Uh, Tom's dating life, but other than that, I'm good. Uh, uneventful. Tom? Uneventful. <laughs> nothing to talk about. Don't let him fool you guys. Nothing, nothing scheduled? Off, off air, he's just slinging like, what do you think of this date spot? You know, <laughs> this girl texted me this, like... Can you believe she sent this gift? Like, 
<laughs> you you got he's gonna so, sell you guys short, but off air. Oh God. Nick, so Nick, what I, what I hate to break to you is when Tom's asking you about date spots, he's just trying to find good restaurants to go eat at by himself. <laughs> That's just reality. It's, it's very true. It's like, eh, is that cool alone? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, will anybody notice if I just sit at the bar and get a really nice meal? Is that cool? <laughs> Is that kosher? You tell that to the girl that he let out of the studio who kissed him on the cheek before I walked in. I don't know what that was. Hey, we don't want this wow. on air. I don't want the other ones to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shoot. That's my bad. Yeah, I hope none of the other ones are listening to this podcast right now, right? <laughs> Tom? It's a, it's a risk. Yeah, don't date any soccer fans and you'll be fine. Yeah, that's... Uh... I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You listen to podcasts? Yeah, we're cool. <laughs> so, Tom, uh, what content do we have at zonecoverage.com lately that we need to know about for the adoring fans? Yeah, we got uh, got a lot of football stuff. Obviously, 53-man roster. Sam Ekstrom's been all over that. Uh, we are still tracking the Minnesota Twins. I don't remember if this was on air or off air, but David Naylor taking shots. The local nine. We lost... What was it, 18.5 or something like that today? I saw it get to 18, and I stopped paying attention. I think it's 18.5. Chris Jimenez. I saw the Twins get to 18 losses, and I stopped paying attention. Yeah, I, yeah the Twins have had a rough year. Uh, we will have something. Uh, Brandon will have something on Buxton, who is not coming up as surprise news. But we will also focus on the Tyler Austins, Miguel Sano's, Zay Barrios, all the players that could make an impact next season. That's good stuff. That'd be yeah. That I mean, that's kind of what we're focusing on right now, is because the the games aren't giving you too much to uh, talk about. But um, like and then that. yeah, and then uh, you know, basketball's right around the corner. Dane Moore, Charlie Johnson have uh, a guide out for you that will start probably when you're listening to this podcast. It'll be out Monday. They also have a uh, some podcasts starting with the guards to accommodate it. They'll go through all the players on the roster. Uh, David Naylor will be helping out with uh, the Iowa Wolves. And, uh, yeah, anything you kind of want Minnesota sports here, uh, things are starting to kind of heat up a little bit. With the How Vikings. about the Gophers? Are the, is the Gopher football team going to be any good? They yeah, look pretty good. Yeah, we uh, um, Martin Schlegel, who's new, he's, gonna, he's helping out with baseball, and he's on the Gopher beat for us. We'll do some high school as well. He was there when they jumped all over. Actually, New Mexico State was up, I think, 10-7, and then the – the Gophers ran over him in the in the second quarter, but he'll be on the beat for us. Didn't yeah? Uh, does the, is there a Gopher football podcast? No, we don't have anything specific for that, but we'll have written coverage for the Gophers. Oh, nice. Yeah, I thought there was a go. Is that go for different Gopher sport that we? Yeah, have? so yes. we will have. Uh, uh, we plan to have go for hockey. Go for hockey. Yep. Uh, Nate Wells, uh, Drew Cove, and then uh, Sam Extra will be on basketball this year. Oh, that's right. Nice. Yeah, Sam's a, yeah. Sam's a boss. Sam also started his own podcast, Bring the Beat In. He talked to Reef Hassan about his background, uh, how he got into writing, how he got the big athletic contract, what he's doing for us with the machine. Uh, yeah, all sorts of crazy stuff. It is starting to heat up after kind of a – August is always a little dormant in the sports department. My, my one exciting Timberwolves news thing that happened this week is the Timberwolves are playing a preseason game in Iowa. Nice. Ames, which Brad. is great because it means I get to cover a Timberwolves game this year. <laughs> <laughs> How it, it is it's Ames, right? It is in Ames, yep, at Hilton Coliseum, which is an excellent venue for a game. They call it the David And Naylor It's Classic. on a weekend that Minnesota United aren't at home, so I'm not gonna be in Minnesota for the game it's on It's crazy to think United is not back for twenty days, right? Does September twenty second is their next home game. Yep. That's absurd. It's absurd, and they don't play again for another 10 days Twin, at all. Yeah, so. Twins have had, like, a 10-game road, road trip. So, yeah, it's been interesting times in Twin City. I miss seeing Ibsen do crazy things. Mm. <laughs> do you? <laughs> yeah. You sure? Yeah, one more season of Ibsen, and then I'm done, though. He needs to. <laughs> then, you, then you're off the wild Ibsen ride forever? <laughs> yeah, I think he needs to. Deuces. Well, with that said, um, check out all of the written coverage of all of Minnesota sports, including Minnesota United, on zonecoverage.com. Follow along with podcasts and all of your sports interests on the Zone Coverage Podcast Network. And for Nick Hallett at Prince Hallett on Twitter, Tom Schreier at T Schreier 3 on Twitter, I am David Naylor at Prop Cedar. This has been the Minnesota Soccer Podcast, and we will see you next week. Adios. Adios.